Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. This is going to be on CT of the Esophagus, Pearls and Pitfalls. It's going to be a two-part adventure, and a lot of it is based on this recent article we published in Emergency Radiology, which was CT of the Esophagus in the ER, what you need to know and what you need to remember. So I show you this article because it's something good to read as a companion to this presentation. Now, in this article, we spoke about how CT is critical across a range of GI pathologies in the ER setting, but the esophagus is indeed one of them. We tend to think more about, the, you know, the stomach, perhaps, small bowel, we think about trauma, but the esophagus does present with a range of pathologies. Now, it's not always where the requisition says rule out esophageal pathology. It may be chest pain, you're thinking about PE in dissection, and you find a perforation or esophagitis or a chalasia. So it's really a tricky problem because you're not necessarily doing a protocol specific for the esophagus, but it's important you're able to look carefully at the esophagus. Obviously, in cases where we think about esophageal pathology, we'll have a more specific protocol, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But things we'll talk about, perforation, foreign bodies, esophagitis, achalasia, fistula, and a little bit about neoplasms. I think what we'll do is we'll speak about neoplasms in a different talk on the esophagus. In terms of protocols, Axial and multiplanar CT, particularly coronal and sagittal, are the standards that everybody uses. And I'll show you why at times MIP and volume rendering, including cinematic rendering, can indeed be very helpful. Now, when you think about the esophagus and you think about the mediastinum, we look at many different structures, right? If you're thinking about chest pain or mediastinal pathology, you're thinking about the aorta, you're thinking about the pulmonary arteries, you're thinking about mediastinal structures, maybe there's adenopathy present. But at the same time, what runs straight from top to bottom through the chest? It's the esophagus. And although it's not as popular, there are many pathologies that are easy to overlook. And as I mentioned in the article, and I'll show you examples today, delay in diagnosis and management can lead to significant mortality and morbidity. So early diagnosis is critical. Now, in general, when we're doing CT of the abdomen, we always give water. If I'm doing CT of the chest and I'm thinking about the esophagus, we'll always use water or a different neutral agent. If you're looking for a fistula or a leak from the esophagus, a positive contrast agent, dilute omnipeg would work very nicely. If you're doing a CT esophagram, as we would call it, a good way to do it is when the patient is lying on the table, let them drink a cup of contrast through a straw so the contrast can layer out in the esophagus. Also, you would have given the patient additional oral contrast before the patient got on the table. Now, when we talk about esophageal emergencies, one that comes up is esophageal rupture or perforation, the classic Barhoff's. We always talk about that in a patient who has severe vomiting or retching. Uh, we talk about that perhaps in a patient with pancreatitis. But it can be a number of things. It can be due to a patient having impacted food or a foreign body in the esophagus. Um, so it's really a range of things. But Borhoff syndrome typically results with inflammation and air in the mediastinum. If you think about the esophagus, features of perforation include periesophageal gas or fluid, pneumomediastinum, and extravasation of oral contrast material. Again, if you want to see oral contrast extravasation, you need to use a positive-based agent. Lacerations of the mucosa, either directly from trauma or due to severe vomiting, like in Mallory Weiss uh, syndrome, can show signs of hemorrhage near the site of injury. Outside the esophagus, you also can see findings like pleural effusions. Now, remember, mortality for perforation 
remains under 25% if diagnosed within the first 24 hours, but increases quickly to 60% if management is delayed beyond 24 hours. Here's a good example. You can see in the middle mediastinum the air present here. Obviously, if the patient had a stab wound, if the patient had a recent procedure, if the patient had endoscopy, these all could be reasons for air in the mediastinum. But without any of those, you got to be thinking about esophageal perforation. Was it a foreign body? Was the patient coughing? Was the patient uh, retching? What was going on? The patient, uh, we could not see the exact site of where the leak was, but here it is a couple days later, the patient was given a positive contrast at time of fluoroscopic exam, and you can see exactly where the positive contrast is coming from. So esophageal perforation, again, uh, can be easier diagnosed and localized when you have positive contrast. When you see the air, you know there's a perforation. Now, of course, there are other reasons for air in the mediastinum, tracheal injuries, for example, barrow trauma, for example. But when you're thinking about esophagus, seeing the air gives you the diagnosis, but the location can be more challenging, as in this case. And here it is very nice looking at the four images together, the initial study which showed the air, but we couldn't exactly connect it to the esophagus. And then after the swallow, you see the uh, positive contrast. Now we talk about Borhoff syndrome, and again, uh, people in the past would get uh, esophagrams or swallows. These days, most people don't know how to do swallows, to be honest. Um, and also, it's just not as available. In the ER setting, everybody has a scanner, and you quickly can do the study and very quickly make the diagnosis. This idea of CT esophagram is really ideal for looking at these serious cases. Now, multi-detector CT complemented by CT esophagrams is a one-stop shop. And hopefully, when we look at some of the cases, you'll get that feeling. Now, again, I mentioned at the start that one of the challenges with esophageal pathology, it's not on the requisition. Often it doesn't say rule out esophageal pathology, rule out perforation, rule out esophagitis. And again, the clinical presentation is chest pain. So the typical ER, you're thinking about the section, you're thinking about the coronaries, you're thinking about pulmonary emboli, maybe you're thinking about pancreatitis. This can delay diagnosis or at times lead to a misdiagnosis or an underdiagnosis. Obviously, chest abdominal CT is critical in these scenarios. If you only got an abdominal CT, it's going to make it extremely difficult. Now, I mentioned about protocols, dilute contrast, positive contrast. Uh, you can use Omnipake 6 or 9% solutions, works very nicely. It makes it very easy to confirm the presence of a perforation and be very precise as to where the perforation is. And here's a nice article in the Journal of Emergency Trauma, uh, really showing you a number of cases that you can look at. We also talk about other complications. I think one of the things I mentioned before is multiplanar reconstruction. I think multiplanar reconstruction with 3D rendering can be very helpful at looking at a range of pathologies, increasing your specificity and sensitivity to near 90 to 100%. I think it's very easy to miss esophageal pathology. We talk about foreign bodies, and I'll show you some examples. Like fish bones or chicken bones, they're very small. You know how small the fish bone is. And if you're not looking really carefully, it's very easy to miss it, particularly if there's no extra luminal air. And here's just a nice example. The patient was eating fish and swallowed a bone, they thought. And you can see the linear line here. Fish bones are very dense. You can see it's like a bone, right? There it is right there. You can see on the corona, look how you can see the entirety. It's about two centimeters in length. 
and here it is again. And you can see there's a little bit of extra luminal air. The diagnosis is a chicken bone. You have to go in with endoscopy and take that out. Here's another patient that was eating steak and started retching. And you can see that here it is. There's the steak with some fat in the distal esophagus. Look at it. A, too large a piece of steak. It's stuck here. Uh, the patient basically is lucky they did not rupture their esophagus. This can lead to Borhoff syndrome. You can see and you begin to wonder how large a piece of steak was that. But these are patients often who have esophageal um, infection and then there is a lack of motility and the steak backs up. It may not only be one piece of steak. Uh, look at, but look at the length of that and look how much fat there is here. It was not your basic uh, uh, grade one steak, perhaps. Again, very nicely shown on the sagittal images. You make the diagnosis. You know the patient was eating when the patient's symptoms occurred, so it makes it a, a little bit easier. It's interesting. Um, you, you would wonder, could you see this with every food or any food? I guess theoretically the answer is yes, but the classic thing is steak. And short of a patient having esophagitis or motility disorder, I've never seen it with other things like chicken, for example. And again, look at it on the coronal 3D view very nicely, showing you the transition. Now, esophagitis is inflammation of the esophagus. Now, it can present with severe chest pain. Uh, there are a range of causes from infection to reflux is very common related to certain medications. If the patient takes a detergent or some caustic agent, that can lead to severe esophagitis. Also in patients who are immunosuppressed, be it HIV patients, be it patients with autoimmune diseases, post-transplants, or patients on chemotherapy. All of these patients are at increased risk for esophagitis. Now, with esophagitis, we talk about thickening of the esophagus. It can be focal or it can be long. One of the challenges is esophagitis can be diffuse thickening, and it can be difficult just simply looking at the images, as in a case like this, and distinguishing esophagitis from malignancy. They can look very similar. The clinical history may be helpful, but endoscopy will be necessary. Now, in this case, the patient took a caustic agent from under the sink. You can see marked thickening of the esophagus, the inflammation of the esophagus in its distal two-thirds. But because of the history, you knew exactly why the patient had esophagitis. In this case, the patient had abused alcohol. And you know, patients with alcohol abuse, they get reflux, they, they get all sorts of coughing, they also get, you know, disease like uh, varices, of course, from cirrhosis and portal hypertension. But alcohol abuse can also lead to severe esophagitis. Now, you can see how thick in the esophagus, it's pretty long. If I told you as an immunosuppressed patient, you would say esophagitis due to chemotherapy or immune therapy. If I told you the patient took caustic agents, you would say yes. And the truth is, in this case, if I told you the patient had an ulcerating esophageal cancer, you would say yes as well. So I think one of the things about CT is high sensitivity, but a lower specificity. So I think it'll be important to correlate with clinical history. And of course, at the end of the day, in tricky cases, endoscopy and biopsy will be necessary. And again, you look at this, esophagitis versus cancer, depending on the history. This patient presented with chest pain, and you can see the way these images are targeted. It was rule out dissection, rule out pulmonary embolism. The patient had no pulmonary embolism, had no dissection, and the coronary arteries look pretty good, but you can see severe thickening of the esophagus. The patient's chest pain was the severe esophagitis Look at the length of the esophagitis, the marked wall thickening, the mucosal enhancement. Again, the sagittal view, particularly good at showing you how extensive the inflammation indeed was. Now, this patient 
had a bone marrow transplant. These patients often get the worst esophagitis. Look at the extent of inflammation here. Look at the extent of involvement. The patients often can't swallow and can't eat. It almost begins to look like food matter or fluid is presenting above the area of inflammation and ulceration. Kind of a little bit makes it look like a case of achalasia. But a really impressive example of severe esophagitis, dilatation of the esophagus. Again, in this case, the clinical history made the diagnosis a little bit easier. But again, this could be a very bad case of esophagitis. Pushes you a little bit to think about achalasia. But also, I would think of esophagitis due to a caustic agent. Here's another patient, immunosuppressed. Mark thickening of the esophagus, the lower half of the esophagus, particularly near GE junction. This was mucormycosis, a very unusual infection. Patient had ulceration present. In terms of being able to pick an organism, I wish you a lot of luck. Now, another thing you can see in this patient with coughing and spitting up blood, there's actually active bleeding in the esophagus. In this case, the patient had chest pain, it was a question of dissection, but you see it's a dilated esophagus, which ended up with esophagitis with active bleeding. Remember we speak about active bleed, the CT is really good, looking at the stomach, small bowel and large bowel, but it can also be very helpful in the esophagus. Most of the time when we see esophageal bleeding, it'll be in the lower esophagus and secondary to severe varices. And here's that case with cinematic rendering right here, and there is the site of active bleeding. There it is again. Now, there are a number of other causes uh, that are classic in the esophagus, but let's do this. Let's stop here. We'll come back with achalasia and finish off part two. See you in a couple minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.